Chapter 14, Partial Derivatives, Section 14.1, Functions of Several Variables. A function f of two variables is a rule that assigns to each ordered pair of real numbers x, y, and a set d, a unique real number denoted by f of x, y. The set d is called the domain of f, and its range is a set of values that f takes on, that is, the set of f of x, y, such that x, y is in the domain d. So we'll often write z equals f of x, y, similar to the way we used to write y equals f of x, to make explicit the value taken on by f at the general point x, y. The variables x and y are independent variables, and z is the dependent variable. So as an example, let's uh, evaluate f of 3, 2, and find and sketch the domain for a couple functions. So we just plug in 3 for x and 2 for y, we get that f of 3, 2 is equal to the square root of 3 plus 2 plus 1 over 3 minus 1, which is the square root of 6 over 2. So evaluating um, multivariate functions is pretty much the same as uh, a single univariate functions. The domain is all of the numbers we're allowed to plug in here. So that's all of the x and y values we're allowed to plug in. So it looks like the only danger here is when this thing is negative, because we can't take the square root of a negative, and when this thing is undefined, because we can't define by zero. So this is all the x and y values such that x plus y plus one is greater than or equal to zero, and x is not equal to one for our denominator. So let's see if we can sketch what the domain looks like. Uh, how about we put in the line x plus y plus 1 equals 0. So that's the same as x plus y equals minus 1. So that line looks something like this. And here's minus 1, 0, and minus 1 on the y. So here we are at x plus y equals 0. Then I need to make sure that I account for all values of x and y that are greater than or equal to this line because we're greater than or equal to 0. So, oh, oops. I wrote x plus y equals zero, but it's x plus y plus one equals zero. And I want all these things greater, so I'll shade up in the air. Okay, so those are all of the values that are greater than or equal to x plus y plus one equals zero. However, we also have x not able to be 1. So that means that I need to account for that. So how about this is the line, x equals 1. And I'll draw a dash to indicate that we're, we are removing that from our domain. OK, how about this function? Well, again, let's just try plugging in f of 3, 2 to get some practice evaluating. So we get 3 ln 2 squared minus 3, which is 3 ln 1, which is just 0. Uh, how about the domain? Well, we have to take the natural log of positive numbers, so y squared minus x must be greater than 0. So that implies that x must be less than y squared. So our domain is the set of x, y's such that x is less than y squared. So let's try graphing that or sketching it. Uh, notice that x equals y squared is a horizontal parabola. There's no equal, so I will draw it uh, dashed. So it looks something like that. 
and then it's everything uh, underneath the parabola. So I'll shade to the left. Roughly. And I should have kept going over here. Yeah, something like that. So this is the parabola x equals y squared. Okay, how about an applied example of a multivariate function, a function of two variables? In regions with severe winter weather, the wind chill index is often used to describe the apparent severity of the cold. This index W is a subjective temperature that depends on the actual temperature T and the wind speed V. So W is a function of T and V, and we can write W equals F of T V. The table records values of W compiled by the U.S. National Weather Service and the Meteorological Service of Canada. So let's find f of minus 550 and interpret its meaning in context. So I'll go to minus 5 and 50. So it looks like it's minus 15. So we can write uh, f of minus 550 equals negative 15. And what that means is uh, if the temperature is negative 5 degrees and the wind speed is 50 kilometers per hour, then it would feel as cold as negative 15 degrees. Assuming that there's no wind. So the wind makes it feel colder. In 1928, Charles Cobb and Paul Douglas published a study in which they modeled the growth of the American economy during the period from 1899 to 1922. They considered a simplified view of the economy in which production output is determined by the amount of labor involved and the amount of capital invested. While there are many other factors affecting economic performance, their model proved to be remarkably accurate. The function they used to model production was of the form P of LK equals B times L to the alpha times K to the 1 minus alpha known as the Cobb-Douglas production function, where P is the total production, the monetary value of all goods produced in a year, and L is the amount of labor, the total number of person hours worked in a year, and K is the amount of capital invested, the monetary worth of all machinery, equipment, and buildings. Cobb and Douglas used economic data published by the government to obtain the table on the right. They took the year 1899 as a baseline, and P, L, and K for 1899 were each assigned the value 100. The values for other years were expressed as percentages of the 1899 figures. Cobb and Douglas used the method of least squares to fit the data of the table to the function 1.01 uh, .01 times L to the 0.75 times K to the 0.25. Let's use this function to compute the production in the years 1910 and 1920 and compare our results with the actual values for these years. So our table has actual values and we want to use their uh, function they came up with to compare it to see how good it is at, I guess, estimating or predicting values. So how about we first uh, use their function? So we'll take P of 147, 208, because in 1910, that's when um, L was equal to 147 and K was equal to 208. So we plug those values in we get 1.01 .01 times 147 to the 0.75 and we get 208 to the 0.25. So using a calculator, we see that's approximately 161.9. So we look back at 1910 and we see that the actual value of P was 159. 
so it's pretty close. Let's do the same thing now for um, 1920. So at 1920, it looks like L was 194 and K was 407. So we'll plug those in. So we have P of 194, 407, equal to 1.01 .01 times 194 to the 0.75 times 407 to the 0.25, which is about 235.8 versus an actual value of looks like 231. So it looks like the uh, Cobb-Douglas production function is a pretty good uh, way of estimating these production values. Let's find in, uh, find the domain and range of g of x, y equals square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. I almost said uh, sketch, but I'm going to sketch it anyway. So we have the domain equal to x, y, all of the x, y values such that 9 minus x squared minus y squared is greater than or equal to 0, which is the same thing as saying it's all of the x and y values such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 9. Just move x and y squared to the other side, or move the 9 and divide, either way. So what about our range? Our range is all of the outputs. So instead of x and y values, that's all the z values, such that z is equal to square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared provided that x and y are in the domain D. Well, we have 9 minus x squared minus y squared. Notice that x squared and y squared are both positive numbers, so the most this thing could possibly be is 9 if you subtracted nothing. But no matter how much you subtract, it's going to make it smaller than 9. So this is less than or equal to 9. And if we take the square root, that means that the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared would have to be less than or equal to 3. So this means we can rewrite our range. We can say that our range is really all of the z values such that, oh, notice this is a positive square root. So all the z values such that z is greater than or equal to 0, and less than or equal to 3, which is the same thing as the interval from 0 to 3, the closed interval. So let's uh, just sketch our domain for the heck of it. Notice the domain is just uh, this circle, but everything inside of the circle, so it's a disk. So something like this for our circle. This is uh, x squared plus y squared equals 9. So here's 3 and here's minus 3. And it's everything inside of the disk, so I should shade inside. If f is a function of two variables with domain d, then the graph of f is a set of all points x, y, z in R3 such that z is equal to f of x, y, and x, y is in R domain. So that means that the graph is some three-dimensional thing in R3. We're able to do all of our domains in two dimensions, but that doesn't actually tell you what the graph of the function was. It was just, you know, the inputs. Then we could say that the level curves of a function f of two variables are the curves with equations f of x, y equals some constant k where k is in the range of f. So let's uh, sketch and graph the, we'll sketch the graph of a uh, multivariate function. So we'll sketch the graph of f of x, y equals 6 minus 3x minus 2y. So what we need to do is set uh, z equal to that, kind of like the way you would set y equals when you had a function of one variable. And then how about we manipulate this a little bit. This is the same as 3x plus 2y plus z equals 6. 
which we recognize as the equation of a plane. So to graph a plane, we usually just figure out what the intercepts are. So how about the x-intercept? That's when y and z are 0. So plugging that in, we get that x equals 2. So our x-intercept is 2. Similarly, we plug in x and z equal to 0 to find that our y-intercept is 3. And we plug in x and y as 0 in order to find that our z-intercept is 6. So it should look like some kind of, uh, at least when it's slicing through, it looks like a triangle. Remember, it's infinite, so it's not exactly a triangle, but something like this. I'll put in, uh, how about an x-axis first? So this is at 2, 0, 0, and do y axis. This could be at uh, 0, 3, 0, and I need a z axis. And that's at 0, 0, 6. So remember, the plane is infinite, but it's too difficult to draw, so I just draw a slice of the plane. The function f of xy equals ax plus by plus c is called a linear function. The graph of such a, such a function has the equation uh, z equals ax plus by plus c, or you can uh, move the z over to the other side and have a minus z in there, and it says equal to zero. In any case, it is a plane. Basically, linear functions in one variable were lines, but when we add another variable, we get the three-dimensional version of a line, which is a plane. Uh, how about we do another example of a, a graph of a three-dimensional function. So let's graph this uh, square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. So, so z equal to the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. And that means that I can square both sides and get z squared is equal to 9 minus x squared minus y squared. I'll move z over and I get, well, I'll move x squared and y squared over to make everything positive, and I get x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9. Notice, however, z was a positive square root, as we saw before, so z is greater than or equal to 0. So if z was anything, this would be a sphere. So z is positive, so it's a hemisphere. It's just the top part. So let's see if I can draw it. Hmm. Something very roughly like that. I'll try to put some axes in. Okay, just for the heck of it, I'll put in my intercepts. So our x-intercept would be 3, 0, 0. We just plug in zeros for y and z. Or just realize this is a sphere. So the hemisphere will just intersect at the radius, which is the square root of 9, which is 3. So this would have to be 0, 3, 0. And this would have to be 0, 0, 3. Let's use a computer to draw the graph of the Cobb-Douglas production function. So how about we use our handy dandy grapher. So I'll pull that out, click on 3D graph, and we'll plug in 1.01. Instead of L, I'll plug in X to the 0.75. And I'll plug in y to the 
All right, pretty cool. So this is our three-dimensional graph. How about I try copying that? So we'll put that back. And let's see if I can paste it. Well, it needs to be way smaller. It's a shame that the background is black, but that's okay. Put it right there. And maybe you can draw yours a little bigger. But here's L. It goes from 0 to 300. Here's K. It also goes up to 300. And notice the production increases as both of these guys increase, which makes sense. Let's find the domain and range and sketch the graph of h of x, y equals 4x squared plus y squared. So notice the domain is what we can plug in, and this is just uh, x squared and y squared. You can plug in anything. So the domain is all of our x and y values. So that's just all of R2, everything in the plane. The range, however, is everything we come out. Notice there's no way to get a negative number out of a square. So our range, I'll use R, a little bit confusing, but I did a double bar for the Rs too. But the single R I'm using to indicate range, and that's just gonna be all of the values from zero to infinity. So all of our non-negative numbers. Uh, notice that sketching this graph is easy if you were paying attention to section 12, because we did this graph. It was an elliptic paraboloid. And it just looks something like this where here's the z-axis poking up, and here's x and y. I think we did this uh, as example 4 in section 12.6. A contour map for a function f is shown in the figure. Let's use it to estimate the values of f of 1, 3, and f of 4, 5. So this is what we were talking about when we mentioned the whole level curve thing. The contour map is just a, a two-dimensional plot of a bunch of uh, curves that each represent fixed uh, values for a function. So for example, z is 50 along this curve. So it's like you can think of it as like upward 50 in the air. And then notice as you go uh, closer and closer over here, the curve gets up farther and farther and farther until it gets to 80. Similarly over here. So you can kind of visualize it popping out at you in 3D. Anyway, we have f of 1, 3. So let's look at 1, 3. It's like roughly around over here somewhere. So it's in between 70 and 80. So how about we say it's like 73. Let's also get f of 4, 5. So that's right around here somewhere. And it looks like it's between 50 and 60 but closer to 60, so how about I say it's 56? Next, let's sketch the level curves of the function f of xy equals 6 minus 3x minus 2y for certain values of k. So we can set 6 minus 3x minus 2y equal to k, and then we can set this as 3x plus 2y, oops, plus k minus 6 equals 0, which we recognize as the equation of a line. So let's do a bunch of these. Notice that, uh, well, if I plug in k equals 6, then this collapses. I just get 3x plus 2y equals 0. So that's just this line. So that's it k equals 6, so I mean this is x and this is y and this is 0. If I were to go uh, plugging in k equals 0, then this minus 6, and then I could set it equal to 6, move it over. So I actually get uh, this line, and this is at k equals 0. 
and you can plot that using uh, intercepts is probably the easiest way to do it. And you can see that it keeps moving over the x value as you increase k, oh, sorry, as you decrease k. As you increase k, it moves over to the left. So this is k equals minus six. And if I increase k to 12, then I get this line. So it should sort of make sense that these level curves are all these, you know, parallel lines. They're all supposed to be equally spaced because uh, the graph that we did was a plane. And slicing a plane is exactly what it would give you. But, you know, you slice a three-dimensional thing, you get like kind of like the two-dimensional version. So it makes sense you would get a line out of it. How about the level curves of this function, g of x, y equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared? Well, we can set the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared equals to k, which means that x squared plus y squared equals 9 minus k squared. So let's draw a couple of these. Notice they're all circles. So if k equals 3, then we just have x squared plus y squared equals 0. So that's like a circle with radius 0. Then if k equals 2, then we just have a nice circle of radius uh, square root of 5, it looks like, because 2 squared is 4, and then 9 minus 4 is 5. So let's see if I could draw that. You can just pretend that this is the circle of the correct radius. And then as we go out more, let's say k equals 1, then square root of 8 is the radius, so it's a little bigger. And then as we go out more, let's say k equals 0, we get square root of 9 as the radius. So it looks like the circles are getting closer and closer together. So of course it gets harder and harder for me to draw it. Oh man, I was doing pretty well up until, eh, whatever. So that, those are all supposed to be perfect circles. So you definitely have to use your imagination on this one. Let me just indicate this was k equals three. k equals two. k equals one. And k equals zero. And notice that kind of makes sense. Remember this three-dimensional um, graph was a hemisphere. So it should make sense that the uh, closer I get to the center, the steeper it gets as we go up. But as I go farther out, it kind of smooth, smoothens out, levels off. Imagine this thing popping out of you. Let's sketch some level curves of this function now. So we'll set it equal to constant, and we'll look at a bunch of constant values. So we have 4x squared plus y squared plus 1 equals k. And that means that we can just divide by uh, 1 fourth times k minus 1 so that we can get this thing to be equal to 1 and have our x's and y's by themselves. So we should recognize that, that uh, as a family of ellipses. How about I use, um, eh, well, I'll draw the axes first and then I'll use another color for my level curves so that you can see what it looks like with the level curves in the actual uh, function. So let's say we have this family of ellipses. So my ellipses are not much better than my circles but these are the level curves. And if I was to draw the actual function, how about I do that? So this is actually gonna look really bad, but that's okay. I'll first do, put the xy plane, I'm trying to give you a little perspective, so I'm drawing this in 3D, I'll throw in the z-axis after. So I've got my 
level curves, which are these ellipses. And they're like on the ground. And then you can imagine the level curves projecting upward to give you the elliptic paraboloid. So the elliptic paraboloid, we already drew it, it looks something like this, very roughly, where the z-axis pokes out into it. So here's the z-axis, and you can see the way that the level curves correspond to um, constant values in the z-axis. Like if I were to draw it, then this level curve in the center projects up to this level curve over there, and the next level curve over here. They're kind of like uh, slices of this thing, and it makes sense that they would be ellipses. No, it's the opposite. This is inside, and then this can be visible. Okay, so imagine you either take this elliptic paraboloid and you flatten it by squashing down all of these level curves into the plane, or if you start with the level curves, you're projecting upward each of the curves to build your uh, graph of your function in 3D. So they can help you visualize stuff. Even if you can't draw your actual function, drawing level curves can tell you a little bit about it. So let's try plotting level curves for the Cobb-Douglas production function. Doing that, you could see that the level curves end up something like this. Here's L, here's K. We'll go from 100, 200 to 300, where here's 100, 200, and 300, and the curves would look, uh, let's see, something roughly like this, where here's the level curve at k equals 100, and then here would be k equals 120, and then here's k equals 140, and 160, and k equals 180. 200, 220, and so on. So you can roughly see what the level curves will look like, and that makes sense given the way that this thing stretched out in 3D. Okay, how about a function of three variables? Well, it's pretty much the same as a function of two variables, except that now we are looking at plugging in something in 3D. So before, in one variable, we plugged in something one-dimensional, and two variables, we plugged in something from the plane, two-dimensional. But as a function of three variables, what we plug in, our domain, is already 3D. So the thing we get out is 4D. So trying to draw that or graph that is a huge challenge. So it becomes very important to be able to look at um, our domain and analyze that to get an idea of what the range could kind of, or some of the characteristics of it. You can't even really kind of see what it would look like unless you really have a good imagination, but let's just do an example. How about we have this uh, function of three variables? Let's find the domain. Notice that we can plug anything in for sine, but we can only plug in positive values for the natural log, or not negative, or no, no, actual positive, yeah, we can't even plug in zero. So that means that we need z minus y to be greater than zero. So our domain d is equal to the set of x, y, z's, the order triples, such that, well actually no, it's just all of the order triples in R3, such that Z is greater than Y. And I wrote R3 just to stress that this is three dimensional. So we call this a half space because it's all of the points that lie above the plane, Z equals Y. It basically cuts the, the three dimensional space in half and the other half of the three-dimensional space is your domain. D 
the level surfaces of a function f of the variables are the curves of the equations where f of x, y, z is equal to constant k. Notice that these become very important for functions of three variables because in two variables you might plot a level, cur uh, level curve to get information about the surface that you draw if you have trouble drawing it, but in three variables you can't even imagine drawing the uh, graph in four dimensions. So you really need level surfaces to tell you stuff about that graph. So as an example, let's look at um, this function of three variables. Trying to graph this thing in the fourth dimension would be insane, but in the third dimension, if we set x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to constant values of k, then for each constant value of k, the slices of this four-dimensional thing are three-dimensional um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals k objects, which are just spheres. Kind of like when you would slice um, uh, a sphere x squared plus y squared equals z squared, when you let uh, all of those be variables, but then you would set z equals to a constant k, you would get x squared plus y squared equals just circles, like when we saw the hemisphere. So when you slice up a surface, you get curves, but when you slice up this function of three variables, then you go up a dimension, so you don't get curves when you slice. Each slice is a three-dimensional surface. So to try drawing this thing, I need to draw some spheres. Yeah, my spheres get worse and worse. Okay, so let's say here's a, a sphere, and I need to draw another sphere inside of it because notice that as we change the value of k, the radius of the sphere changes. So we get all these spheres, one sitting inside of the other. So let's see if I can like draw a little window cutting out into our sphere. Oh. Uh, maybe a bigger window, help us see more. So how about something like this? And then inside, we have a sphere. So here's another sphere inside. And then I can draw a window in that one too. So let's see if I can do that. So I'm cutting that sphere open to show you that inside that sphere is another sphere. So how about this? Yeah. Very, very roughly. You definitely have to use your imagination for this one. Maybe I can make this a little bit more spherical, but... Hmm. Okay, so let's throw some axes in, because this is sitting in the XYZ plane. So here's, let's say, uh, the Y axis. No, actually, no, that should poke through. There we go. And then here would be the x-axis. Should have taken art class to get better perspective. All right, the outermost sphere, let's say, is x squared plus y squared equals, let's say, 9. And then for a different value of k, we can make this thing even smaller. So let's say this is x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals 4, and we can keep making k smaller to get smaller and smaller spheres inside. So this could be x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals 1. We can keep extending this process. There's nothing stopping us from going past three variables, three uh, independent variables. So a function of n variables, we have n independent variables, where we just plug in as many of these variables as we want, and we have uh, n tuples in our domain, and then we denote by rn the set of all such n tuples. So remember, the output is still just going to be one variable, and that'll just be our dependent variable, which depends on all of the other variables we plug in. This can become very difficult notation when we're trying to use it in general to keep writing x1 through xn every single time. So sometimes we just use vector notation to make this thing more concise. We say that uh, this bold x or 
x written like that is equal to this uh, vector x1 through xn. And we'll often write f of that x instead of f of x1 through xn with all of those x's.